Returning now to In God's Name by David Yallop. One of the injustices that Luciani continuously worked to eliminate in Venice concerned a widely prevalent attitude toward the mentally retarded and the handicapped. Not only did the mayor and city officials show indifference, but Luciani also found the same prejudice among some of his parish priests. When he went to give first communion to a large group of handicapped people at St. Pius X Church in Marghera, he had to cope with a delegation of protesting priests who argued that he should not do such a thing. Quote, these creatures do not understand, unquote. He instructed the group that he was personally ordering them to attend the First Communion. After the Mass, he picked up a young girl suffering from spina bifida. The congregation was completely silent. Do you know what you have received today, he asked the little girl. Yes, Jesus. Are you pl And are you pleased? Very. Luciani turned slowly and looked at the group of protesting priests. You see, they are better than we adults, unquote. Because of the reluctance of the city council to contribute to special work centers for the handicapped, Luciani was obliged initially to rely on diocesan funds in the bank known as the Priest's Bank, unquote, Banca Cattolica del Veneto. In 1972, after he had been made patriarch, he became aware that it was no longer the Priest's Bank. Joining the regular crowd in his outer office who required help, he now found bishops, monsignors, and priests. In the past, the bank had always loaned money to the clergy at low interest rates. It had been founded so that the diocese could contribute to the vital work for that section of society which Luciani described in the following words, quote, They have no political weight. They cannot be counted on for votes. For those reasons, we must all show our sense of honor as men and Christians toward these handicapped people, unquote. By mid-1972, however, the low-interest loans had stopped. The Venetian clergy were advised that in the future they would have to pay the full rate of interest no matter how laudable the work. The priests complained to their bishops. The bishops made a number of discreet inquiries. Since 1946, the Istituto per le Pere di Religioni, the IOR, usually referred to as the Vatican Bank, had held a majority share in Banca Cattolica del Veneto. Veneto. The various dioceses in the Veneto region also had small shareholdings in the bank, amounting to less than 5% of the bank's stock. In the normal commercial world, this would make the minority shareholder vulnerable, but this was not the normal commercial world. That, I would interrupt that as something of an understatement here. <laughs> a clear understanding existed between Venice and the Vatican that the IOR's vast shareholding, by 1972 it was 51%, was insurance against any potential takeover by a third party. Despite the very low interest rates charged to the Veneto clergy, the bank was one of the wealthiest in the country. Where the priest banks, where the priest banks, the parishioner will follow. A significant amount of the bank's wealth was derived from real estate holdings in northern Italy. This happy arrangement had now been abruptly terminated. The bank that the bishops believed they owned, at least morally, had been sold over their heads without the patriarch or any person in the Veneto region having been consulted. The man who had done the selling was the Vatican Bank's president, Paul Marchinkus. The man who had done the buying was Roberto Calvi of Banco Ambrosiano, Milan. The bishops of the region descended en masse on the patriarch's office in St. Mark's Square. He listened quietly as they outlined what had happened. They told him how in the past, when they had wished to raise capital, they had turned to the Vatican Bank, which had loaned them money, holding their shares in Banca Catolica as security. Now these shares, along with a large stake independently acquired by the Vatican Bank, had been sold at a huge profit to Calvi. And uh, recall that in regard to the Pacetti conglomerate man manipulating by Sindona, there was also a lot of illegal uh, goings-on in connection with the whole uh, Banca Catolica di Veneto. Continuing, the enraged bishops pointed out to Luciani that they had been given the opportunity, that had they been given the opportunity, they could have raised the necessary money to repay the Vatican Bank and thereby reacquire their shares. What was more pertinent in their eyes was the appalling breach of trust perpetrated by Marchinkus, acting on behalf of the Vatican, which claimed to be the moral leader in the world. He had, had at the very least, displayed a total lack of morals. The fact that he had kept the entire profit up on the transaction for the Vatican Bank may also have caused some of their anger. The bishops, the bishops urged Luciani to go directly to Rome. They wanted papal intervention. If that intervention took the form of firing Paul Marchinkus, it was clear that in the Veneto region at least, not many tears would be shed. Luciani calmly weighed the problem. Ever a prudent man, he felt he needed more facts before taking such a problem to Pope Paul. Luciani, bega Luciani began to probe quietly. He learned a great deal about Roberto Calvi and also about a man named Michele Sindona. What he learned appalled him. It also alerted him to the dangers of complaining directly to the Pope. Based on the information he had obtained, it was clear that Calvi and Sendona were highly favored sons of the Church who were held in high esteem by Paul VI. The man Albino Luciani turned, the man Albino Luciani turned to 
was one who had become a close friend over the previous five years, the Under Secretary of State, Monsignor Giovanni Benelli. Though Benelli was number two in the Secretariat of State under Cardinal Vio, to all intents and purposes, Benelli ran the department. And as Pope Paul's troubleshooter, Benelli not only knew where all the bodies were buried, but he was also responsible for the placement of quite a number of them. And as we've seen now, when we're talking about bodies being buried in connection with this whole tangle, it should be taken fairly literally, although we're not accusing uh, Benelli here. It, it, certainly a lot of bodies turn up. Benelli listened while the Patriarch of Venice told his story. As the Monsignor gave his eminence another cup of coffee, Luciani ut uttered a qualification. I have not, of course, seen any documentary evidence, unquote. I have, responded Benelli. Calvi is now the major shareholder in the Banca Catolica Cat Cat del Veneto. Marcinka sold him 37% on March 30th. Benelli was a man who enjoyed reeling out facts and figures. He told the wide-eyed Luciani that Calvi had paid 27 billion lira, approximately $45 million to Marcinkus, and that the sale was the result of a scheme hatched jointly by Calvi, Sindona, and Marcinkus. He went on to tell of a company called Pacetti, or Pacetti, which had been purchased by Calvi from Sindona after its price had been grossly and criminally inflated on the Milan Stock Exchange, and of how Marchinkus had assisted Calvi in, ma in masking the nature of this and other operations from the eyes of Bank of Italy officials by putting the Vatican Bank facilities at the disposal of Calvi and Sindona. Luciani was bewildered. What does all this mean, he asked. Tax evasion? Illegal movement of shares? I also believe that Marchinkus sold the shares in your Venice Bank at a deliberately low price, and Calvi paid the balance via a separate 31 billion lira deal on another bank, unquote. Luciani became angry. What has all this to do with the Church of the Poor? In the name of God, Benelli held up a, sand, a hand to silence him. No, Albino, in the name of prophet, unquote. Does the Holy Father know these things? Benelli nodded. So? So you must remember who put Paul Marchinkus in charge of our bank. The Holy Father. Again, a point worth underscoring here. Paul VI is the one who has installed Paul Marchinkus. Continuing. Precisely. And I must confess I fully approved... I've had cause to regret that many times. Then what are we to do? What am, I to what am I to tell my priests and bishops? You must tell them to be patient, to wait. Eventually, Marchinkus will overreach himself. His Achilles heel is his greed for papal praise. But what does he want to do with all this money? He wants to make more money. For what purpose? To make more money. And in the meantime, should my priests get out begging bowls and tramp through the Veneto? In the meantime, you must counsel patience. I know you have it. Teach it to your priests. I'm having to apply it. Albino Luciani returned to Venice and called his fellow bishops to his office. He told some of them what had transpired in Rome, enough to make it abundantly clear that the Banca Cattolica del Veneto was now lost forever to the diocese. Later, some of them talked about it. They concluded that this would never have happened in the days of Cardinal Urbani. They felt that Luciani's innate goodness had proved a useless weapon against the IOR. Most of them, including Luciani, sold what remaining shares they held in the bank to express their disapproval of the Vatican's conduct. In Milan, Roberto Calvi was gratified to note that his brokers had acquired on his behalf another small piece of the priest's bank in Venice. Albino Luciani and many others in Venice closed their accounts at the Banca Catolica. For the, by Patriarch of Venice, for, the, for the Patriarch of Venice to move the official diocesan accounts to the small Banco San Marco was an extraordinary step. He confided to one colleague, Calvi's money is tainted. The man is tainted. After what I have learned of Roberto Calvi, I would not leave the accounts in his bank if the loans they granted to the diocese were totally free of interest. Luciani then attempted to get the directors of Banca Catolica to change the name of the bank. He insisted that for the word Catholic to appear in the title was an outrage and a libel against all Catholics. The point being here that uh, in the late 60s, that uh, then Cardinal Albino Luciani, eventually Pope John Paul I, had run afoul of the Vatican Bank and apparently was contemplating doing something about it. Basically, the Vatican Bank had run afoul of him, I should say, and he was uh, aware of its, uh, of its machinations. Now, when you hear, as at the very end of that last segment, you hear Albino Luciani talking about how, um, uh, t attempting to get the, uh, the name of the Banca Catolica, the Catholic Bank, to change its name, and it's saying that the, uh, the, the name and the title was an outrage and a libel against all Catholics. Well, not only was this sort of a... Uh, was this uh, kind of like uh, initiating a blood feud with people like Marchinkus? Naturally, Marchinkus, of course, the highest-ranking Vatican uh, finance officer. 
but Calvi and Sindona, who considered themselves to be princes of the church. But in the more practical sense, uh, part of the reasons that both Calvi and Sindona were so successful was because of that very successful use of the Catholic Church as a mask, as a blind for their activities. And to have somebody talk about stripping them of the veneer of, of uh, the Catholic Church um, essentially, it would be to strip them of their uh, their protection. So this was not merely um, a, uh, a cosmetic sort of a change that would be something uh, that they would be hearing about. It would be something that would actually, we would think, strike fear into the hearts of people like Calvi and Sindona. Now, um, what happened, of course, is that Pope Paul VI died. And uh, rather strangely and uh, rather unexpectedly, the man who became uh, the next pope was Albino Luciani, the uh, the former um, leader, uh, I just completely forgot the word here. I've just, uh, oh, the... Um, Cardinal of Venice. The Cardinal of Venice, but there, yeah, there was another word too. Uh, oh, the Patriarch of Venice, right. Albino Luciani, became Pope John Paul I. And, of course, uh, one of the very first things he did was to move against these people whom he had already seen making a travesty, as he felt, of the church's duty um, uh, to the poor. And uh, we don't really have time to talk too much about Pope John Paul I tonight, which is a shame. And uh, I suggest that uh, those of you out there who get a chance and who are interested in this stuff go out and read some of the books about Pope John Paul I, who by all accounts would have been an absolutely splendid pope if he had been allowed to complete um, any kind of reign whatsoever. He was a really remarkable man with a very genuine um, uh, love, apparently, for uh, average people, for the poor and, and people who were not political uh, big names and were not big financial players, um, an obvious weakness of Paul VI. Uh, and uh, really a man, a, a very brilliant man, actually, who had, uh, had written some very deceptively simple, actually very clever books of philosophy, and uh, was quite popular just among the average people of Italy long before he became Pope. But uh, more importantly, Albino Luciani, John Paul I, was a man who felt that the Vatican was foundering, and Paul VI had been Pope since, what, the early 1960s? Since 1963. 63, following John the, John the 23rd. And uh, so it had been nearly 20 years of Paul VI, uh, well, the best thing you can say about it is, is his lax management of his subordinates. I think that obviously looking back at Paul VI's role during World War II, hmm. one could suggest that there was more um, in the way of fault there than merely lax management. But after nearly 20 years of this kind of thing, um, Albino Luciani came into power, again, as Dave mentioned, himself a victim of the maneuverings of Marcinkus and Calvi, determined to be the new broom that after almost two decades was going to sweep the Catholic Church clean and make it exactly what it was supposed to be. Reading again from David Yallops in God's Name. Pope John Paul I had concluded by mid-September that his first priority should be to put his own house in order. By the way, bear in mind, I think he was only elected Pope at the College of Cardinals on the ver at the very end of August or the very beginning of September. He had a very short reign. He was 33 days in office. Pope John Paul I had concluded by mid-September that his first priority should be to put his own house in order. The problem of the Vatican Bank and its entire operating philosophy had become of paramount importance to him. Luciani moved with an urgency that had been noticeably lacking in his predecessor's last years. He was determined that within his first hundred days, the church should at, le at least begin to change directions, particularly with regard to Vatican Incorporated. Within his first week, he had given an indication of the shape of things to come. He assented, in quotes, to the desire of Cardinal Vio to be relieved of one of his many posts, the office of President of the Pontifical Council, Cor Unum. The job went to Cardinal Bernardin Gantin. Cor Unum is one of the great funnels through which pass monies collected from all over the world to be distributed to the poorest nations. To Luciani, Cor Unum was a vital element in his philosophy, that Vatican finance, like every other factor, should be inspired by the gospel. Vio was gently replaced, but replaced nonetheless, by Gantin, a man of great spirituality and transparent honesty. The Vatican village buzzed with speculation and with defensive moves. Some proclaimed that they had never met Sindona or Calvi or any of the Milan Mafia who had invested the Vatican during Pope Paul's reign. Others in their individual bids for survival began to funnel information to the papal apartments. Um, you will remember in one of the seg segments that we read earlier that when uh, 
uh, Il Crack Sedona began to show up, how people like Luigi Menini and others were throwing up their hands saying, uh, uh, who could ever have dreamed that this, that this man was such a madman? Uh, some of these people, despite the fact that they themselves were among the chiefest and most canny uh, financial uh, players in all of Italy and perhaps in all of Europe. Um, the same thing is going on here. A few days after the Gantin appointment, the new pope found a copy of an Italian Office of Exchange Control, UIC, circular on his desk. There was no doubt that the circular was a direct response to Il Mondo's long open letter to the pope, outlining an untenable situation for a man committed to personal poverty and a poor church. The circular, signed by Minister of Foreign Trade Rinaldo Osola, had been sent to all Italian banks. It reminded them that the IOR, the Vatican Bank, is, quote, to all effects a non-residential banking institute, in other words, foreign. As such, relationships between the Vatican Bank and Italian credit institutes were governed by precisely the same rules that applied to all other foreign banks. The minister was particularly concerned with currency abuses involving the illegal flight of money from Italy. His circular was a clear ministerial admission that these abuses were realities. It was seen in Italian financial circles as an attempt to curb at least one of the Vatican Bank's many dubious activities. In Vatican City, it was generally regarded as further confirmation of the death knell for Bishop Paul Marcinkus's presidency of the bank. And uh, I would just insert here, as we will find out, that the rumors, as Mark Twain once said, uh, the rumors of uh, Bishop Paul Marcinkus's death knell turned out to be much exaggerated. A story I, meaning the author Yallop, I believe to be apocryphal, but that many within the Vatican and within the Italian media believe to be true, began to circulate around the Vatican village in early September of 1978. According to the story, before the sale of Banca Cattolica del Veneto, Albino Luciani had gone to the Vatican in an attempt to stop the sale from going through. In reality, Luciani had the meeting with Benelli after the sale, as recorded earlier in this book. The version that buzzed through the village introduced elegant Italian variations. Luciani had directly confronted Paul VI, who had responded, quote, Even you must make this sacrifice for the church. Our finances have still not recovered from the damage caused by Sendona. But do explain your problem to Bishop Marcinkus, unquote. A short while later, the story goes, Luciani presented himself in Marcinkus's office and repeated the list of diocesan complaints concerning the bank sale. Marcinkus heard him out and then said, quote, Your Eminence, have you nothing better to do today? You do your job, and I'll do mine. At which point Marcinkus showed Luciani the door. Any who have seen Marcinkus in action will know that his manners match his nickname of the Gorilla. To the bishops, monsignors, priests, and nuns in Vatican City, the general feeling was that the confrontation had happened. Now, out of the blue, the small, quiet man from Belluno could remove Marcinkus at a moment's notice. Members of the Curia organized a lottery. The object was to guess on which day Marcinkus would be formally removed from the bank. In addition to the investigation being conducted on his behalf by Cardinal Villot, the Pope, with his characteristic mountain shrewdness, opened up other lines of inquiry. He began to talk to Cardinal Felici about the Vatican Bank. He also telephoned Cardinal Benelli in Florence. That's the guy that he went to to talk to the first time about the Banca Cattolica del, del Veneto. It was from Giovanni Benelli that the Pope learned of the Bank of Italy investigation into Banco Ambrosiano. It was typical of the way the Roman Catholic Church operated. The Cardinal in Florence told the Pope in Rome what was happening in Milan. The former number two in the Secretariat of State had built a strong network of contacts throughout the country. Licio Gelli of P2 would have been suitably impressed at the range and quality of information to which Benelli had access. Benelli's contacts included very well-placed sources within the Bank of Italy. These were the sources that had informed him of the investigation taking place within Roberto Calvi's empire, an investigation that in September 1978 was moving to its climax. What particularly concerned Benelli, and subsequently Luciani, was the part of the investigation that was probing Calvi's links with the Vatican. The Bank of Italy contact was certain that the investigation would be followed by serious criminal charges against Roberto Calvi and possibly against some of his fellow directors. Equally certain was the fact that the Vatican Bank was deeply implicated in a considerable number of deals 
that broke various Italian laws. The men at the top of the investigating team's list of potential criminals inside the Vatican Bank were Paul Marchinkus, Luigi Menini, and Pellegrino de Strabel. Okay, now, what we're going to do here, uh, we are po poised. Um, unfortunately, uh, as we all know, um, John Paul I, the former Cardinal Albino Luciani, did not get to make his full investigation. As Dave mentioned, he had a very short reign, the second shortest reign in the entire history of the papacy, um, only 33 days. Uh, we are going to talk about his rather strange death in just a moment when we come back to finish up and wrap up tonight's uh, segment of Radio Free America. So don't go away. We're going to come back and we're going to discuss some of David Yallop's theories as to why John Paul I, he feels, was murdered and for what reasons and who might have been some of the possible culprits. So that's coming up. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more of Radio Free America with Dave Emery and myself, Nip Tuck. Broadcasting from Foothill College, this is determination on the part of Albino Luciani, former Patriarch of Venice, uh, recently uh, newly become Pope John Paul I to put an end to uh, to uh, the the manipulations uh, by supposedly the friend of the poor, the Catholic Church, um, and uh, the manipulations of world currency and uh, illegal uh, shipment of goods and and uh, dummy companies and supporting fascist governments through shell corporations and things like that. Already now, as we saw, Luciani was contemplating cleaning up the Vatican Bank. Well, obviously, he passed away before he was able to do it. He only lasted 33 days. Uh, unfortunately, we simply don't have the time to go over all of the suspicious aspects of his death. We are going to go over uh, some of the curious as curious handling of the death of uh, Pope John Paul I, and in particular, the uh, role in that curious handling of Cardinal V.O. Returning to In God's Name by Yallop. If Luciani died naturally, Vio's actions and instructions are completely inexplicable. His behavior becomes understandable only when related to one specific conclusion. Either Cardinal Jean Vio was part of a conspiracy to murder the Pope, or he saw clear evidence in the papal bedroom indicating the Pope had been murdered, and he probably determined that to protect the Church, the evidence must be destroyed. On the small bedside table was the medicine that Luciani had been taking for low blood pressure. By the way, I would interrupt here. The only medical condition Luciani had was low blood pressure. He supposedly died of an acute myocardial infarction. That is extraordinarily unlikely with low blood pressure. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he ate in moderation, and he had no other uh, indications of ill health and no uh, heart condition as such at all. Continuing. On the small bedside table was the medicine that Luciani had been taking for low blood pressure. Vio pocketed the medicine. From the dead pope's hands, he took the notes on the papal transfers and appointments. These he pocketed as well. The Pope's last will, which had been in the desk in his study, was removed. His glasses and slippers disappeared from the bedroom. None of these items has ever been seen again. Vio then created for the shocked members of the Pope's household a totally fictitious account of the circumstances leading to the finding of Luciani's body. He imposed a vow of silence concerning Sister Vincenza's discovery and instructed the household that news of the death was to be suppressed until he indicated otherwise. Then, sitting down in the Pope's study, he began to make a series of telephone calls. Based on the eyewitness accounts of people I have interviewed, the medicine, the glasses, the slippers, and the Pope's will were all in the bedroom and the papal study before Vio entered the rooms. After his initial visit, all the items had vanished. News of the death was given to Cardinal Confalonieri, the 86-year-old dean of the Sacred College, then to Monsignor Casaroli, head of Vatican Diplomacy. Vio instructed the nuns on the switchboard to locate Arch Archbishop Giuseppe Caprio, his deputy and the number three man in the church hierarchy who were presently vacationing in Montecatini. Only then did he telephone Dr. Renato Buzanetti, deputy head of the Vatican's health service. Next, he phoned the Swiss guard. Th that, by the way, is the uh, Vatican guard. Speaking to Sergeant Hans Rogan, R-O-G-G-A-N, Vio told him to come immediately to the papal apartments. Father Diego Lorenzi, the only man to have accompanied Luciani from Venice, wandered shocked and bewildered through the, through the apartments. He had lost a man who over the past two years had been a second father to him. In tears, he attempted to understand, to find some meaning. When Vio eventually decided that the world would know, millions would share Lorenzi's grief and bewilderment. 
Okay, continuing on a little further in, in God's name. Uh, by the way, Dr. Buzzanetti comes in, makes a very brief examination, and informs VO that the cause of the death was a heart attack. Again, as Dave said, sort of in, unlikely um, on the basis of the type of medication he was taking for low blood pressure. VO had already decided before Buzzanetti's examination, which took place at approximately 6 o'clock a.m., that the body of Albino Luciani should be immediately embalmed. Even before his phone call to Cardinal Confolonieri at 5.15 a.m., VO had acted to ensure a rapid embalmment. The Signoracci brothers, Ernesto and Renato, had embalmed the last two popes. Now a dawn telephone call and a Vatican car that arrived at 5 o'clock a.m. were the beginning of what was to prove a long day for the Signorazzi brothers. For them to have been contacted so early clearly establishes that the Vatican gave the relevant instructions to the Institute of Medicine, which employs the brothers, at some point between 4.45 and 5 o'clock a.m. At 7 a.m., more than two hours after his body had been discovered by Sister Vincenza, the world at large still remained ignorant of the fact that Pope Paul I was dead. Bear in mind now that uh, Sister Vincenza, this woman who actually discovered the body, had discovered it sometime before uh, 5 o'clock, between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. I can't remember the exact time. Um, and apparently, according to Yallop's uh, uh, conclusion here, which seems quite justified, um, the embalmers were actually called not only before anybody else, but within like 10 minutes after the body was discovered. At 7 a.m., more than two hours after his body had been discovered by Sister Vincenza, the world at large still remained ignorant of the fact that Pope John Paul I was dead. The Vatican village, meanwhile, was totally ignoring V.O.'s edict. Cardinal Benelli in Florence heard the news by telephone at 6.30 a.m. Grief-stricken and openly crying, he immediately retired to his room and began to pray. All the hopes, dreams, aspirations were shattered. The plans Luciani had made, the changes, the new direction, all had come to nothing. When a pope dies, all decisions yet to be publicly announced die with him, unless his successor decides to carry them through. By 7.20 a.m., the bells in the parish church in Albino Luciani's birthplace, Canale da Gordo, were tolling. Vatican radio remained silent on the death. Finally, at 7.27 a.m., some seven and three-quarters hours after the death had been discovered by Sister Vincenza, Cardinal Vio felt sufficiently in control of events. Quote, this is the bulletin. This morning, September 29, 1978, about 5.30, the private secretary of the Pope, contrary to custom not having found the Holy Father in the chapel of his private apartment, looked for him in his room and found him dead in bed with a light on, like one who was intent on reading. The physician, Dr. Renato Buzzanetti, who hastened to the Pope's room, verified the death which took place presumably toward 11 o'clock yesterday evening as, quote, sudden death that could be related to acute myocardial infarction, unquote. Note, again, that right away the first bulletin says at 5.30 the Pope's body was discovered and not discovered by Sister Vincenza, who really discovered it, but by a private secretary. Later bulletins stated that the secretary in question was Father McGee, who, according to the Vatican, usually said Mass with the Pope at 5.30 a.m., and that when he died, the Pope had been reading The Imitation of Christ, the 15th century work usually attributed to Thomas a Kempis. Along with the medicine, the papal notes, the will, the glasses, and the slippers, the fact of Sister Vincenza's discovery of the body at 4.45 a.m. had also vanished. Even with two and three-quarter hours in which to concoct a story, V.O. and those who advised him had botched up the job. While every newspaper and radio and television station in the free world was carrying stories based on the Vatican bulletins, V.O. was having difficulties making his story stick. The difficulty centered around the imitation of Christ. This embellishment, involving as it did a book that Luciani revered, might have seemed like inspired thinking to V.O. The problem was that there was not a copy in the Pope's bedroom, or for that matter, in the entire papal apartments. Luciani's copy was still in Venice. A few days earlier, when he had wanted to quote accurately from the book, he had sent Lorenzi to borrow a copy from his Vatican confessor. This copy had been returned before the Pope's death. Now Lorenzi's complaints about an obvious fabrication could not be stilled. The Vatican finally dropped this particular lie after having maintained it until October, 20, until October 2nd, four days. Within those first four days, the false information given out by the Vatican had become, in the minds of the people, the reality, the truth. And people were deceived by other false information that came out of the Vatican. 
There was, for example, the tale of Father John McGee going to the Pope's bedroom shortly before 10 p.m. on the 28th. According to this story, which emanated directly from the Roman Curia, McGee had told the Pope about the murder of a student in Rome. Quote, Are those young people shooting at each other again? Really, it is terrible. These were widely reported around the world as being the Pope's last words. They provided the added bonus of giving a possible explanation for the unexpected death of Luciani. He died of shock after hearing such appalling news. The conversation between McGee and Luciani did not occur. It was a Vatican fabrication. Another Vatican fabrication which played a role in Vio's announcement was that Luciani generally said Mass with McGee at 5.30 a.m. Mass in the papal apartments was not until 7 o'clock a.m. As previously noted, Albino Luciani spent the time between 5.30 and 7 a.m. in meditation and prayer, usually alone, sometimes joined at about 6.30 by McGee and Lorenzi. The image of McGee becoming alarmed by Luciani's non-appearance at 5.30 is simply Vatican fantasy. The tragic, unexpected death shocked the entire world. The massive bronze doors to the Basilica of St. Peter were closed. The Vatican flag was flown at half-mast. These were external indications. But news of Albino Luciani's death was so stunning that the disbelief expressed by his personal doctor was echoed by millions. He had delighted the world. How could God's duly elected candidate pass so quickly from them? Cardinal Villebrands of Holland expressed the thoughts of many when he said, It's a disaster. I cannot put into words how happy we were on that August day when we had chosen John Paul. We had such high hopes. It was such a beautiful feeling, a feeling that something fresh was going to happen to our church. Cardinal Baggio, one of the men whom Luciani had determined to move out of Rome, was considerably more restrained. Quote, the Lord uses us, but does not need us, he had said after viewing the dead body. He continued, he was like a parish priest for the church. Asked what would happen now, he responded calmly, now we will make another one. Baggio, though, was one of the exceptions. Most people displayed deep shock and love. In Florence, when Cardinal Benelli finally emerged from his room at 9 o'clock a.m., he was immediately surrounded by reporters. With tears still running down his face, he said, The church has lost the right man for the right moment. We are very distressed. We are left frightened. Man cannot explain such a thing. It is a moment that limits and conditions us. Back in the Vatican, Vio's plans for an immediate embalming had run into trouble. Cardinals Felici in Padua and Benelli in Florence, who knew very precisely the nature of the changes Luciani had been about to make, were particularly disturbed and indicated as such as much in telephone conversations with Vio. Again, bear in mind, uh, cutting in here, bear in mind that uh, in his hands when his body was discovered were the very changes that he were working on, among them changes uh, into the Vatican Bank, one of them maybe, perhaps, although we don't know for certain, uh, the final uh, excision of Paul Marchinkus from his control of the Vatican Bank. Already there were murmurs among the Italian public that an autopsy should be performed. It was a view that under the circumstances Benelli and Felici were inclined at least to consider. If the body were embalmed, then a subsequent autopsy would be far less likely to reveal that the cause of death had been poison. Officially, the Vatican created the impression that the body of Pope John Paul I was embalmed before being put on public display in the Sala Clementina at noon on the 29th. In fact, this was not the case, as Father Diego Lorenzi's comments make clear. Quote, the body was taken from the private apartment to the Clementina Hall in the papal apartments. At that time, no embalming had been done. Papa Luciani was dressed by Father McGee, Monsignor Noé, and myself. I stayed with the body, as did McGee, until 11 in the morning. The Signorazzi brothers came at that time, and the body was taken to the Sala Clementina. The contrast to Pope Paul's death was startling. Then there had been little public emotion. Now there was a flood. On the first day, a quarter of a million people filed past the body. The public speculation that this death was not natural grew by the minute. Men and women were heard shouting as they passed the body, Who has done this to you? Who has murdered you? Meanwhile, the cardinals who were gathering in Rome debated about whether there should be an autopsy. 
If Albino Luciani had been an ordinary citizen of Rome, there would have been no debate. There would have been an immediate autopsy. Italian law states that no embalming can be undertaken until at least 24 hours after death without dispensation from a magistrate. If an Italian citizen had died under circumstances similar to those of Luciani, there would have been an immediate autopsy. For men with nothing to hide, Vio and other members of the Roman Curia continued to act in incomprehensible ways. When men conspire to cover up, it is inevitably because there is something to hide. It was from a cardinal residing in Rome that I learned of the most extraordinary reason given for the cover-up. Quote, He, as cardinal is speaking, he, meaning V.O., told me that what had occurred was a tragic accident, that the Pope had unwitt unwittingly taken an overdose of his medicine. <coughs> Excuse me. The Camerlengo, they're calling V.O. a Camerlengo, that's sort of Meyer Domo of a household. <coughs> Excuse me. The Camerlengo pointed out, that if an autopsy was performed, it would obviously show this fatal overdose. No one would believe that His Holiness had taken it accidentally. Some would allege suicide, others murder. It was agreed that there would be no autopsy. So Vio has told this one cardinal that Pope John Paul I died of an overdose of his own medicine, an accidental overdose. Yallop continues, On two occasions I have interviewed Professor Giovanni Rama, the specialist who is responsible for prescribing the Effortil, Cortiplex, and other drugs to alleviate Albino Luciani's low blood pressure. Lucia Luciani had been a patient of Dr. Rama's since 1975. Rama's observations regarding a possible accidental overdose are illuminating. Quote, An accidental overdose is not credible. He was a very conscientious patient. He was very sensitive to drugs. He needed very little. In fact, he was on the minimum dose of Effortil. The normal dose is 60 drops a day, but 20 or 30 drops per day were enough for him. We were always very prudent in prescribing medicines. Further discussion with my cardinal informant established that Vio had arrived at his deduction of an accidental overdose in those few moments in the Pope's bedroom before he pocketed the medicine bottle. Vio was clearly a highly gifted man. The Pope dies alone having retired to his bedroom a well man who has just made a number of crucial decisions, including one that directly affects V.O.'s future. Without any forensic tests, without any internal or external evidence whatsoever, the Secretary of State deduces that the Pope has accidentally killed himself. Perhaps in the rarefied atmosphere of the Vatican village, such a story has credibility. In the real world outside, actual evidence would be essential. Some of the key evidence that would have established the truth had already been destroyed by V.O., the medicine and the notes Luciani had made that detailed the vital changes. The extent of V.O.'s panic can be gauged from the disappearance of Albino Luciani's will. It contained nothing of significance with regard to his death, yet it disappeared along with the other vital pieces of evidence. Why the Pope's glasses and slippers also vanished remains a mystery. Rumors swept through the Vatican village. It was said that the alarm light on a panel in the papal apartments had glowed throughout the night, but that no one had responded to the call for help. It was said that signs of vomiting had been found in the bedroom. Various items had been stained, and this was why the slippers and glasses were now missing. Vomiting is frequently <coughs> excuse me, one of the symptoms of a digitalis overdose. Behind closed office doors, bishops and priests now speculated about the sudden... <coughs> I'm having a sudden tragic death myself here. Um... <coughs> Excuse me, I've got something in my throat. Behind closed office doors, bishops and priests now speculated. I think you better finish this part. All right, right? here we go. Behind <coughs> closed office doors, bis bishops and priests specul now speculated about the sudden tragic death of the Russian Orthodox Archbishop of Leningrad, Nicodine. He had been received in a special audience by Albino Luciani on September 5th. Suddenly, without warning, the 49-year-old Russian prelate had slumped forward in his chair. Moments later, he was dead. Now the word went around the Vatican that Nicodem had drunk a cup of coffee intended for Albino Luciani. Nicodem was in poor health and had already had several heart attacks. In the frightened Vatican village, though, these facts were swept aside. His death was now seen in retrospect as a sign, a warning of the awful events that had just occurred in the papal apartments. In the course of the day, everything else within the papal apartments belonging to Albino Luciani was removed, including his letters, notes, books, and a small handful of personal, personal mementos, such as the photographs of his parents with Pia. 
Vio's colleagues from the Secretariat of State removed all the confidential papers. Soon, all material evidence that Albina Luciani had ever lived and worked there had been put into boxes and carried away. By 6 p.m., the entire 19 rooms of the papal apartments were totally bereft of anything remotely associated with the papacy of Luciani. It was as if he had never been there, had never existed. At 6 o'clock p.m., the papal apartments were sealed by Cardinal Vio. They were to remain unopened until a successor had been elected. So uh, the point is, a lot of very, very strange things uh, occurred here with regard to the, the investigation, quote-unquote, of the death of Albino Luciani, Pope John Paul I. The fact that no autopsy was performed is very strange. Uh, Cardinal Vio's removing of a lot of different uh, items from the bedroom of Albino Luciani is also very strange. His story about an, how the uh, with an autopsy should not be performed, Vio's that is, about how an autopsy should not be performed because the uh, Pope had taken an accidental overdose of his own medicine, but nobody would believe it was accidental, is even stranger still. And the fact that uh, Vio further basically quartered all information, cornered all information about the shooting, of the, about the uh, Pope's death until several hours afterward uh, raises questions about Cardinal Vio. Now, one of the key things about Cardinal Vio here, and he's one of the people we're looking at in terms of a possible cover-up of Pope John Paul I, who was in the process of cleaning out the Vatican Bank, the, uh, well, basically the, the, this cancer on the papacy, I guess we could uh, refer to it as, borrowing from Richard, ne borrowing from uh, Watergate terminology here. Uh, one of the key people, Vio here, who is apparently front and center in the suspicious handling of Pope John Paul I's death was not only a person who stood to lose his situation as a result of John Paul I, but was also a man very closely connected with the Vatican Bank and Vatican Incorporated, as David Yallop refers to it. Again, returning to In God's Name. Cardinal Jean Vio, whom Albino Luciani had decided to remove from office, retained his position as Secretary of State with the election of Carol Wojtola. Vio also retained his many other posts, including the control of the vital financial section, the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See, the APSA. It was APSA that had played the Vatican role in the marriage with Sindona. Archbishop Marcinkus had frequently been castigated for bringing Sindona inside Vatican City. Marcinkus bears no responsibility for that act. The decision was made by Pope Paul, Monsignor Macchi, Umberto Ortolani, and the gentlemen of the APSA, including naturally its head, Cardinal Vio. If Luciani had lived, then Vio's removal from the Secretariat of State would have meant would also have meant his automatic removal from APSA. It is this organization, with its, its immense portfolio of investments, not Marcinkus's Vatican Bank, that is recognized as a central bank by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the Bank of International Settlement in Basel. It is a section that has much to hide, dating back to its deep involvement with Sindona. At the time of Luciani's election, Vio had only a short while to live. He was a sick, tired man who by September of 1978 knew he was seriously ill. He died less than six months after Luciani on March 9, 1979. His death, according to the Vatican, was due to bilateral bronchial pneumonia attacks with complications, circulatory collapse, renal and, hepat and hepatic insufficiency. It was known that he had wanted to retire, but it was also known he wanted to pick his successor, and the man he had in mind was not Benelli. If Benelli discovered the scandal of the APSA section, he would undoubtedly alert the new pope. This, combined with the other changes that Vio knew Luciani was about to make, created a powerful motive. If Vio was at the heart of a conspiracy to murder Luciani, the motive would have been the future direction of the church. On the testimony of three Vatican witnesses, Vio considered the changes that were about to be implemented a betrayal of Paul's will, a triumph for the restoration, unquote. He feared that they would take the church back to pre-Vatican Council, too. That his fear was unfounded is not relevant. Vio felt it, and felt it profoundly. He was also bitterly opposed to Luciani's plan to modify the Roman Catholic Church's position on artificial birth control, which would have permitted Catholics throughout the world to use the contraceptive pill. With Paul VI, the creator of Humanae Vitae, barely dead, Vio was watching at close range the destruction of an edict he had many times publicly supported.